Imagine a day where children are guided and nurtured in a way that honors their unique humanness. A day where, instead of being expected to change in order to fit in, children can be met right where they're at. Welcome to Where They're Planted, a podcast for parents and care providers of unique children. Caring for a child with a developmental, emotional, or behavior challenge, a neurodiverse brain, or difficult early life experiences can be confusing and exhausting. On this podcast, we'll help your child flourish and strengthen their roots by helping you not only understand them, but also gain the skills to help them bloom where they're planted. We'll use brain science, nervous system tools, collaborative strategy sessions, and a deep understanding of the developmental process to create a fertile environment around your child in order to nurture their growth. I am your host, Jen Blusky, an occupational therapist with over 25 years of experience and a parent coach. My most closely held title, however, is that of a single mom of two thriving adopted kids, so I have walked this walk. I am truly excited to share, teach, and dive into these important topics on each episode. Welcome back to Where They're Planted. I am so excited to be back to discuss another topic that is fundamental to being with our kids in the most authentic way and using our relationship to enhance development, regulation, and learning for our kids. Today, we are talking about all things attachment. When we are considering our influence on our children from infancy all the way through their adulthood, the quality of the parent-child attachment patterns is paramount. Have you ever wondered why we all have the patterns we have in relationships that often repeat themselves throughout our lives? This is guided by our own attachment history. We all develop our relational patterns, understanding of who we are, and the effect we can have on others and the world around us in part through our attachment patterns. As parents of young or not so young children, we are the greatest influencers on our child's attachment security. I am so excited that we are having this conversation with you because especially with this topic, knowledge is power. My guest today is Meredith Woodrich. Meredith is a close colleague and co-conspirator in our parent coaching at Children's Therapy Network and Thriving Parents Collective. Meredith helped develop our Thriving Parents Collective learning course, which provides training and strategies for parenting within an empowered and attachment-based focus. Meredith has degrees in art therapy, addiction counseling, and experiential education. She works with individuals, groups, and families as an art therapist, counselor, and supervisor in addiction and mental health treatment for over 30 years. She also worked with children and adults on the autism spectrum as a reading tutor and experiential therapist. Meredith is a certified parent coach through the Jai Institute of Parenting. Meredith has raised two children as a single parent, one of whom is on the autism spectrum. She is passionate about supporting personal growth and creative expression in others, and has a particular interest in supporting parents of children with unique needs. She believes in the importance of respecting children as a whole human being and the power of parental self-care in making a positive impact on relationships with children. In her free time, she loves to bike, swim, make art, and be out in nature. So glad to talk to you today, Meredith. Mm -hmm. Excited to be here. I want to start by providing a brief definition of what attachment is in the context of the parent-child relationship. I guess I would describe attachment as an emotional, ideally mutually positive and satisfying bond that's created between the parent or caregiver and the child, and that this bond creates I would describe it as like the set point in the nervous system of the child. So that attachment lives inside of the child as their nervous system. So their attachment lives inside of them and inside of their nervous system, which is powerful stuff. Are there different ways or types of attaching to kids that we notice in our practice that can inform what that set point looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the place that really woke me up to understanding the nervous system element of this came through a book that we used in our training for the parent coaching, The Power of Showing Up by Dan Siegel. So in that book, he talks about different attachment styles, secure attachment being what we're ideally aiming for, where the child feels completely seen and loved and heard. And I guess 
even before I go on, I want to say those are three essential states of being that are necessary to create well-being inside of us as children that we experience through our attachment with our caregivers. And that is I exist, I am loved, and my needs are important. And we know this because our parent mirrors back to us the things that we're doing. If you remember, you know, when your child is an infant, how we gaze into their eyes. And when they lift their eyebrows, we lift our eyebrows. And when they coo, we coo. So we're literally mirroring back to them what we're seeing them express. So then they know I exist. And then when we do that in this loving and attuned way, and they have needs and cry for us and we respond, then they know I am loved and that my needs are important. So that would be a really brief overview of secure attachment. And then he describes in the book, The Power of Showing Up, three different kinds of insecure attachment, avoidant, anxious, and disorganized. And what was interesting to me is the way that he described it is the way the parent shows up for the child in their attachment style, creates wired assumptions in the child about how relationships work and what happens with their needs. Tell me more about that. Uh, That is powerful. It kind of blew my mind. So if we think about brain development, we have three parts of our brain that develop kind of in order and at the same time. And the first part that really takes hold is the brain stem, which is at the place where our spine enters our skull. And it's what we call the lizard brain. It's our basic fight, flight, survival needs are all wired there. And part of that wiring is that we are programmed to turn to our caregiver to meet our needs, because, you know, we humans are absolutely helpless when when we're first born. (laughs) Even at the point where like when you touch an infant's cheek near their mouth, they will turn their mouth as if they're going to try to suckle. Like it's so innate in us to turn to our caregiver, regardless of how our caregiver shows up. So you mentioned in the introduction how attachment ends up creating patterns that we live out our whole entire lives until we change them. Until we choose to change them as adults. Mm -hmm. And this is how that happens because that initial we turn to our caregiver, regardless of how they show up, teaches us that. And I find it so interesting that, you know, you're talking about how children or humans are wired. We are hardwired to attach. We are hardwired to turn to the person who's keeping us safe because we are so helpless as humans for so very many years before we're able to independently care for ourselves. And I want to think about what if the response, the caregiver response is different than or less than, or I should say maybe not a good match Mm -hmm. for what we were needing in the moment. Is that what you're describing by the insecure attachment? Yes, and variations of it, right? So the avoidant is uh, the parent who has a hard time connecting emotionally and maybe doesn't even hear that the baby is crying for your attention until it gets really loud or something like that. And the anxious is always being concerned about what's happening with the baby and I'm going to like ground my own anxiety through taking care of everybody else. The one I want to use as a more detailed example is the disorganized attachment, because that one kind of blew my mind. Like I understood things that I had seen in all my years of addiction treatment that I'd never understood until I read this part. So in disorganized attachment, the parent is still so caught in unresolved trauma of their own that their ability to show up for their child is really impaired, whether that's an act of addiction or um, serious mental health problems or uh, abusive tendencies. Either way, the parent has basically very little bandwidth to respond to the child. I mean, you've got this child who no matter what is going to turn to the parent, even if the parent is terrifying, even if the parent is hurting their body, even if the parent is laying in bed and never gets up. So what does that do for the child? The child learns pretty quickly over time, okay, this parent is here, but they're not really here for me. And from the psychology of a young child, thinking about that brainstem where we have to turn to this person no matter what, if something is wrong with our adult, right, if they're faulty or making mistakes or scary or whatever, 
I can't afford to believe that because that means my life is in danger. So over time, I internalize the problem and pain between me and my parent as my fault. And so then as I grow up, I have a hard time trusting other people. I might have what we now call toxic independence, where I, you know, I'm not ever going to let anybody near me. Or I repeat the pattern of being in relationships with people who say they love me, but they also spend a lot of time hurting me because that's what I'm used to. And the bottom line is just not feeling safe anywhere. And it's so interesting because we all, children especially, are trying to make sense of the world. You know, and so when I hear you described sort of a disorganized attachment, and I like how you're starting by describing it in a pretty extreme way. We're describing secure attachment, and that's sort of the gold standard of what we're looking at. And then we're talking about these sort of like insecure pieces. If I haven't done my own work as an adult, which I'll be really honest, how many of us have fully done our own work as adults? It never ends. Can I parent my kid well? And am I going to be able to do this? And am I hurting my child forever? So as you're talking about disorganized attachment, I remember when I started learning about attachment styles as a parent, there was a lot of shame that started popping up for me around, you know, am I showing my kids an insecure attachment? And does that mean I'm hurting my child and they're never going to be okay? And so I want to take a minute to talk about the subtleties of just what we might see, you know, the parents that are listening, what we might see if there's curiosity around, hmm, are there some differences in attachment or are we seeing some threads of insecure attachment? When that parent-child relationship is showing up, not always in a secure way, Mm -hmm. we might identify that, oh, I tend to be more anxiously attached with my kiddo and this is what I'm seeing because of it, Mm -hmm. not in a judgmental way, but as a way of providing information and then knowing what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many different variations to look at. So one of the things that comes to mind is a family I've worked with where I would say there's been disturbance in the attachment relationship between mom and one of the children, not nearly the extreme that I, you know, use when I said disorganized attachment. And how it's showing up in the child is the child often wants to be in charge of all the decision making and often says, no, I don't want mom to play with that. No, I don't want mom to do this with me. No, a lot of no to mom. But then will moments later revert to behaving as if she's three or four years younger than she really is, and suddenly needing mom. And I think of that as being a kind of anxious attachment, right? Like, I don't want you, I want you. I don't need you, I need you. And the flip-flopping is, of course, really confusing to mom. Yeah. And And a little bit sad, probably. Yes, absolutely. Because sometimes in the midst of all of that, that, when the child is trying to make herself feel safe, on her own, she says, rejecting and sometimes painful things to mom. And then when she's really like, okay, I'm a young kid. I can't do this on my own. I actually need my mom. Then she becomes really young and wants the mom. And and then that part feels good. Yeah. So you're describing what we see with so many of our parent-child relationships is that Mm push-pull, that push-pull, push-pull. I need you. I don't need you. I want you. I don't want you. And then you know, when you look at the function for the child, that often plays itself out in emotional regulation, which we should really talk about is the connection point there. And for the parent, it can really rock their attachment to their child. You know, I know experiencing this as a parent myself, that idea that my child is pushing me away and I'm still supposed to be open and available is really, really challenging and takes a lot of awareness on the part of the parent. Let's talk a little bit about how these insecure or secure attachment styles impacts our emotional development. Yeah. I think to some degree, it slows it down sometimes really significantly, right? In the sense that we don't get to the point where we as the child, practice understanding what's happening to me with these big feelings. 
And there's a sort of neediness, I think, that doesn't ever get satisfied when the relationship is anxious, for example. So if you, as the parent, show up with anxious attachment, which I would say I had a fair amount of that as a parent, there's this kind of duality between I'm showing up and I'm almost micromanaging your life because I'm so concerned that everything is good for you. And the parent is doing that for the child. And so the child begins to rely on, okay, you're, you're like always here up in my business, helping me with everything. And then as the parent, all of a sudden my own anxiety takes over and I'm overstimulated by everything. And so then I'm either like, ah, I can't handle it. Or then I'm really activated or I sort of shut down and like, I'm done and I'm gone. And so what happens for the child, again, like the wired assumptions is the child wonders which version of my parent is going to show up and is my parent going to show up? So there's this constant, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I can't really trust. I can't really land in safety. And that landing in safety is what allows the child to actually experience their own emotions. Right. right? Yeah. I find that for our kids who are in a parent-child system that's sort of more insecure, which many of us are, I mean, that's just the reality, yep. is the child ends up tuning more into the parent's emotions than their own. Yep. And so this idea of attend to your own body and attend to your own emotions so that you can learn how to manage your own emotions doesn't get a chance to play itself out or practice. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. The child ends up orienting themselves around the parent and the parent's moods and expressions. And so then doesn't have much practice at paying attention to their own or even what's going on. Like in an avoidant attachment, most kids would not even know that they're having feelings. Right. Because there's no seeing the emotion mm -hmm. that the child is feeling mm -hmm. in those scenarios. Tell me about what's happening then for the parent in these moments when, I mean, I'm thinking through some of the parents that we've worked with and well, and you know, my own experience as a parent, to be really honest, in the idea that knowing that I want to show up and be secure for my child, but then my own generational goodness that we all get, right? Of like, wait, can I feel my feeling? And like, is it real? And how is that different from my kids? And I need to take care of my own feelings. And how does that play out for parents? Yeah, I think that's kind of the core struggle that I see with the parents that I work with more than anything else is the parents' own ability to tune into what's happening inside of themselves. I think most parents nowadays are really overstimulated. I mean, our entire culture is, you know, constantly bombarding us with visual and auditory stimulation, if nothing else. And so I think that's where parents get stuck is not knowing what they're needing. So when we talk to them about taking care of their own needs, you know, they roll their eyes at me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have time to do that. I've no got time for self-care, right? right? I, I'm lucky if I walk the dog after dinner as my exercise or whatever. And so even just our definition of self-care is kind of narrow in that way. But what we end up doing is living in a world of reactivity. And so we we aren't in charge of our own experience because we don't even know what's going on half the time. I think that's the biggest challenge. And so we've kind of laid out what a secure attachment does in a general way for a child and how it impacts their development and then what happens when there's some insecure flavors. And I'm going to say it again, knowledge is power with this topic. Understanding your own patterns is not meant to be a place of shame because we all have our own patterns. It's an opportunity for curiosity of how we could maybe choose to shift it or not, right? How we could choose to show up different. Our children don't necessarily have the cognitive skills in place yet or the developmental skills to choose to shift it, but we as the adults do. And so I want to spend a few minutes here talking about if we're noticing some of these things, where do we start? If we're noticing this insecure edge with our children and we're able to honor like, oh, I'm showing up in this way, where do we start? What do we do first from an attachment lens? Yeah, that's such a good question. And you kind of answered it to some degree by saying we're noticing it. 
awareness, just like knowledge is power, awareness is power to self-awareness and then being able to respond to ourselves. So we can't teach kids how to regulate their own emotions if we can't regulate our own emotions ourselves. Yes. We're going to say that again. We cannot teach kids how to regulate their emotions if we cannot regulate our own emotions. We are the guideposts. Absolutely. And so permission to do that, permission to have that experience of my child is saying something rejecting to me. And in that moment, I realize, wow, I've contributed to this dynamic. And what they're saying to me is really hurtful. I'm hurt and I feel it in my heart right now. And I'm just going to take a beat. The tantrum is really loud and that's overstimulating to me. And I can take a beat and recognize that was really hurtful to me. And I'm going to come back to it later and be kind to myself and understand it and soothe myself. And I'm going to turn back to my child. So that's one version of it. Another version of it is when your child is calling out for you, I hear so many parents say, they're coming at me, they're coming at me, and they're suddenly yelling at me, mom, 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 mom. Like, why can't they just ask me nicely, (laughs) right? (laughs) And it's because we missed it. A lot of times we just missed it when they asked us nicely because we were doing something else or so many of us do this. We're, you know, returning emails or whatever, the kids in the other room, mom, mom, mom. And the first time they said it, I heard it and I make note in my mind, okay, I'm going to have to go and find out what they need in just a minute. But I didn't tell them that. I just said it to myself. And so then they're waiting to hear a response from us. And so we don't realize that in those moments, if we were to just say, this is oversimplifying, of course, but if we were to just say, I hear you, I'll be with you in just a moment, they might still escalate, but they've got the response. So they know that anchors them. My parent hears me, my parent sees me. Well, this is creating safety, Mm -hmm. creating safety for our kids. And I hear you saying that, you know, this ability to honor your own emotion is creating safety for ourselves as the parent. I spend a lot of time talking to parents about how our experience gets to be valid too. It's not the child's job to fix, right? We support children's emotions. It's not children's jobs to support us. Mm -hmm. That is the difference between the parent and child. However, We get to have an experience too, and we get to create safety for ourselves, which is the shift for the adult towards more secure attachment. Yeah. I can be okay in my own self, no matter what chaos my child is circling around me right now. Can I give you a really super dramatic example of that that I just saw in session the other day when I was working with an OT? And so I was there to sort of help the parent practice her own self-regulation, like I'm co-regulating her so that she can eventually co-regulate with her child. And this is a child who's like, no, I don't want you to play with me, you know, doing that sort of dynamic. And we seeing that through a lot of the session and I'm working with mom and then mom all on her own just has this moment of kind of sighing and sitting a little bit more deeply in her chair. And the second she did that, Her daughter turned to her, mom, I want to play with you like this. It was absolute magic. It happened. Boom, boom, just like that. And it was because mom did it all on her own. Oh, I can land in my body. I'm okay in this very second. And it's like the daughter picked up on it immediately and said, mom, you're okay. Then I can be okay with you. That is a shift towards secure attachment. Mm -hmm. And when we can do that, have reps of that over and over again. If you're sitting here listening to this thinking, oh my gosh, I have a lot of work to do. That's the little piece. It's that little. It's I can settle in myself and I can see you, child, for what you need right now. I may not give it to you, but I can see you and I can hear you. That is the shift towards creating a more secure attachment, no matter what age your kiddo is. Yes. Yes. And we just build on those little moments. And I would say the, the flip side of that is whenever as the parent, we can initiate a moment of connection with our child, whether it's just we look them in the eye and smile with a little bit of a twinkle, or we give them an unexpected hug, even just those little tiny moments, they light up our child's brain. Again, those basic needs, I'm being seen, I'm loved. I didn't even have to ask for it. Those are the magical moments. We do more and more and more of those. And we, it's like we're building a new pathway to connection and safety then in the relationship. That's powerful stuff. 
I think we're going to leave it there. We could talk about attachment and we probably will talk about attachment for many more episodes. <laughs> but for now, pay attention to what you're seeing in your own attachment with your child and experiment with some of those little glimmers of just seeing and hearing your child just for a couple of seconds and see if you see a shift. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for joining, Meredith. Thank you. My pleasure. Where They're Planted is a Lit Path Studios podcast and is produced by Jamie Gale and Jen Blusky. Music is by Gaston Reen and Pod5. Thank you for loving your child right where they're planted.